the fact that I'm sitting in my computer right now, writing this out, is an absolute miracle. My hands won't stop shaking, but I have to get this out. If I can prevent even one person from experiencing what I have just been through, then it will be worth it to push myself through writing this. For as long as I can remember, the Church of Sight has towered over my neighborhood, perched upon a grassy hill. Before I stepped foot into that tall, cylindrical building, I did not know its name. Everyone in town just called it the Tower. Most of my friends, including myself, paid very little attention to it. From my house, you could always see cars in their parking lot, but I'd never actually met or spoken to any of the people that had been inside. I could have gone the rest of my life never knowing what went on in that godforsaken place. That is, if it hadn't been for my friend, Kelsey. Kelsey was much more adventurous than I, always looking for ways to make me uncomfortable or nervous. I swear she was addicted to my reactions to the stupid things she would inevitably get us into. It was 10 a.m. on a Saturday. The sun was just now breaking through the clouds, shining a golden beam directly on the towering church on the hill. I was sitting in the passenger seat while Kelsey drove. We were on another one of her surprise adventures that I had grown accustomed to unwillingly participating in. I say I was unwilling, but in truth, I loved going on adventures with her, even if it drove my anxiety through the roof. She had a way of getting me to keep riding with her time after time. Are you ready for this? Kelsey said with a smile as she looked over at me. She was relatively short with brown hair, held back in a tight ponytail. Am I ever ready for these? One of these days I'm going to end up in a padded room because of you. I said, half joking. She narrowed her hazel brown eyes at me. Oh, stop being so dramatic. It'll be fun. The sound of tires crunching gravel hit my ears as Kelsey pulled off the paved road. At first, I really didn't know where we were. Sitting on my phone while she drove helped calm my nerves, but I'm sure I would have been able to tell where we were going if I hadn't been doing that. That's when we turned the corner to reveal our destination. Wait, wait, no. We're not going to the tower, I said in protest as we pulled into the gravel parking lot. Oh yes we are, Kelsey said, pulling into a space and putting the car in park. It's got to be a church of some kind. I bet they'll be so thrilled to have new visitors. And besides, I've always wanted to see what's inside this place. I tried to protest further, but Kelsey had already gotten out and started walking toward the entrance. There she goes again, doing that thing she does. How do I always give in to her? I opened my door and hopped out of her sedan. It made a thud and a latching sound as I shut it, before I started jogging to catch up with her. I had never really gotten a good look at this place before. I had never been this close to it. Was this place really a church? It didn't look like any I had ever seen. This building looked more like a lighthouse without the glass windows and lamp on top. In fact, this thing had no windows at all. Just bare concrete all the way up to a presumably flat roof. If I had to guess, I'd say it was about 150 feet tall. Hey, let's get moving. Kelsey called over to me from the large double doors, what looked like the only way in or out. I looked down from the tower to see her waving at me. Taking a deep breath before deciding to follow, I jogged over to her. There were words on the door, written in a flowery golden script. For I was blind, but now I can see. What was that supposed to mean? I didn't have much time to ponder it before Kelsey pushed open one of the doors and walked inside. I followed quickly after against my best judgment. Once inside, I was shocked to find the interior to be well furnished. The smell of stained oak filled my nostrils as I looked around. This place was for sure a church. Pews lined both sides of an aisle, carpeted in an ornate red rug, running from the door up to a pulpit. 
Perched atop it was a golden statue of an unblinking eye. There must have been fifty or so people seated throughout. A tall man in an expensive fitted suit stood in front of his congregation, preaching with a booming low voice. It did not appear that anyone inside had noticed us. I looked over to Kelsey and she just smiled at me with pure delight. She waved for me to follow her before taking a nearby seat. I followed. Brothers and sisters, we are gathered here today once again to celebrate the light and love of our Creator. It is a good day to have the sight, to see beyond the norm and into the heart of our Maker, which is all around us. Let us not. The pastor stopped suddenly, his eyes darting to meet mine with a snap that was almost audible. It seems as though we have two that have not been awakened, my brothers and sisters. My heart stopped. The man at the pulpit would not break his gaze, and I was so shocked that I couldn't look away. Not until I felt a tug on my arm. Kelsey was trying to get my attention. I looked over to her. She looked at me, and then looked forward, pointing. I looked back to find that everyone in the room was staring directly at me. The air in the room felt cold and still. Something was not right. It seemed as though we were not welcome here. I think we should go, I said to Kelsey in a low voice. She nodded and we stood up to leave. We didn't make it to the middle aisle before I felt a strong hand on my shoulder. Not so fast. Pastor Jeff would like you to come up front. The voice behind me was smooth and honeyed. If not for our current situation, I would call it pleasant. I looked over to Kelsey, and another man had hands on her too. The grip he had on me was strong, and I knew I could not fight it. Before I could think of anything else to do, we were being marched up the center aisle towards Pastor Jeff. I darted my eyes left and right to find everyone still staring us down with no expressions on their faces. Looking forward, I saw Jeff with his arms wide, now standing down and in front of the pulpit. The walk seemed to slow time, and my heart raced faster and faster. The only sound apart from our footsteps was the echoing tick-tock of the large clock on the wall behind the pulpit. It has been a long while since we have had any new visitors, Jeff said as we finally made it to the front. Kelsey suddenly burst into tears as she fell to her knees. Now, now, child, there is nothing to fear. We are here to give those who are worthy of it the sight. Kelsey looked over at me, eyes red with a look of panic in her face. My throat went cold at the sight, and my hands started shaking. Two men appeared out of a doorway to our right, carrying silver plates with matching goblets. White steam rose from them as they approached us. All will be explained in due time, but right now we must administer the test. Jeff motioned for the two men to start. The man holding me pulled my arms behind my back, tying them together with a large zip tie. The same was done to Kelsey before I felt a foot in the back of my knee. Falling to the ground with a thud, I let out a yell before promptly being pulled back up to sit on my knees. Listen, man, I'm sorry. I think we're at the wrong place. It just let us go. I pleaded, my eyes now starting to swell. Oh, but you are mistaken. You are exactly where you need to be. Jeff spoke with a harsher tone. I will open your eyes. Administer the test. The two men holding the goblets approached Kelsey and I, setting down the plates before bringing the goblets to our lips. I won't drink it. I shouted before getting another kick, this time in the back. I promise we will let you go once you drink, Jeff said coldly. I looked over at Kelsey, 
and she nodded at me. Maybe he's telling the truth. I looked back and nodded. Before I could think on it any longer, I had the goblet up against my lips. It smelled terrible. The man holding it raised it, and the liquid went in my mouth before I swallowed hard. It tasted like black tea, not as bad as I imagined. For a moment, I felt nothing. Then it hit me, fire in my stomach, worse than any I had felt before. My head began to spin as the room seemed to go dark. Everything around me disappeared except for Jeff, who was now face to face with me, his hand under my chin. His eyes went black and his skin started to smolder. The smell of burning flesh made me instantly sick, and I began to vomit. Falling to the floor, I retched over and over before puke turned into dry heaves. I could hardly breathe between my stomach reflexes, desperately trying to expel anything that might still be in sight. Jeff stood up, looking off to his congregation. It appears as though the boy is not worthy. The only thing left to do is to prep the girl for her secondary initiation. Jeff's words echoed in my head as I drifted in and out before finally blacking out. The sound of rusted chains swinging slowly back and forth woke me. At first, I did not remember what had happened or where I was. Slowly, my vision returns to me. What I saw dropped my heart into my stomach. Corpses rotting all around me. The sound of insects slowly feasting on dead flesh filled my ears. The smell was unbearable. I was lying face down in a pile of dead bodies. I pressed my hands into the pile. A sickening wet suction sound filled the room as I pressed against them to pick myself up. Stepping carefully over the bodies, I made it out of the pile. My hands were covered in blood, and my stomach soured. The memory of all that had happened started coming back. Where's Kelsey? I jumped to my feet and started looking everywhere that I could. My hands no longer bound, I started rattling the gate, holding me in this strange chain-link cell. To my surprise, the gate was not latched in any way. It swung open right away. Who the hell captures someone and places them in an unlocked cell? I didn't stop to ponder. I had to find Kelsey. In front of me was a hallway. It looked as though I was in an old World War II underground concrete bunker. Dim bulbs on the ceiling gave little light, casting ominous shadows on the walls. Lacking any other options for paths to take, I started walking slowly toward whatever may lay at the end of that hall. The corridor that I found myself in was not very wide. I never knew that tight spaces terrified me before then, but as I kept moving, I felt those walls closing in. Suddenly, I heard footsteps. My heart started racing at the thought of finding more of those people down here. Then it happened. Everything was black. Pitch black. My breathing quickly got out of control. My stuttered, panicked breath now filled my ears. Lights out again. Oh my. That soothing, honeyed voice filled the space around me. Guess I get to pay my friends a visit while no one's watching. Oh Christ, he's gotta be close by. I covered my mouth with my hands to try and quiet my panicked breath. With how loud it sounded in my ears, there's no way he would not hear me. More footsteps getting closer and closer. Every inch of my being wanted to scream and run as fast as I could. I held the urge and hugged the wall next to me. It's completely dark in here. If I could just sit still, maybe he will walk right by me. Step after step, closer and closer. I stopped breathing. That's when I realized how close he was to me. I could feel his breath on my neck. He had to be right there. The blood pumping through my ears sounded like bombs going off. 
It was so loud I thought he might actually hear my heart beating. Never fear. I'm here to keep you all company, my friends. The man spoke as he walked by. His friends? Does he mean all the bodies in my cell? Wait. He just passed me. With that realization, I drew a quick breath and started walking slowly in the opposite direction away from him, my hand running alongside the wall for guidance. I can't believe I actually pulled that off. I don't know where I'm going, but I have to find Kelsey. It felt like I wandered in the dark for hours before I found what looked like light coming from under a door. I had laid down to try and peek through the bottom. Through squinted eyes, I could barely make out a room that looked like an office. A pale man sat at a computer desk, looking at a screen full of security camera displays. I heard a door open, and another pale man walked in. Tom, we got that girl locked up in the vision chamber. Jeff wants to get started soon. The pale man waited for Tom to nod before turning around and exiting the office. I laid there and watched Tom for a few minutes before he got up and started walking towards the door I was looking under. Oh Christ, of course he has to come this way. I popped up and started looking around for a place to hide. The only light came from under that door and it was very difficult to see. I heard him insert a key and turned the lock to open the door. There I stood in the open. There was no place to hide. He pulled the key out and began turning the knob. I'm so screwed. I'll have to try and defend myself. Thoughts of how I would try and fight this guy ran through my head as cold sweat poured down my back. God, what do they want now? I heard Tom say, letting go of the door and walking back to his desk. Jesus, saved by a phone call. You have to be kidding me. Tom speaking. Yes, I... Okay, I'll be there. Tom said, before hanging up the phone. I dropped to the ground again to see where he was going. I just barely caught a glimpse of him as he exited the room through the door on the left. Thank God. I think he left the door unlocked, too. I jumped up and opened the door in front of me. The room was small and smelled of piss. It took a moment for my eyes to adjust to the light, but I started searching Tom's desk as soon as they did. The first drawer I opened had a pocket knife and a manila folder. I shoved the knife in my back pockets and sat down to start looking through the files. Inside were profiles with pictures of people I did not recognize. I kept flipping through the pages until I jumped. There, looking back at me, was a photo from Kelsey's social media. Age, hometown, and a bunch of other personal information, including her social security number. I flipped the page again and found my profile. With all the same, very accurate information. There was a spot for notes at the bottom of the page. Written in red ink were the words, Terminated. Terminated. Did they think they killed me? Maybe that's why my cage was unlocked. They just threw me in with the other bodies. Dried blood flakes off my hands as I turned back to Kelsey's profile. The notes section for her read in black ink, ready for initiation. Thank God she's still alive. Or, at least there's a chance. I looked up at the screen with the camera footage. I couldn't find Kelsey on any of the feeds. All I could think to do was try and follow Tom through the door on the left. I just sat there for a moment, trying to come to terms with all that had happened. I never thought I would ever see anything like this happen in my life. No point in dwelling on it. I had to find my friend. She may have brought me to this place, but it was up to me to get her out. The hallway connected to this door was just as cramped as all the others, but it was dimly lit like the first one I found. It seemed to go on forever, twisting and turning, finding dead end after dead end. That is, until I saw a red light coming from a vertical shaft, 
housing a metal ladder. After getting a closer look, I found where the light came from. An exit sign, and above that, a hatch. Was that really the way out? I could have climbed that ladder and ran out of that place like a bat out of hell. I would be lying to you if I said I didn't consider it for a moment. But no, Kelsey wouldn't leave me behind, and I wasn't going to leave her. After some time, I came across another door, this one with a barred window at head height. I peered inside to see Kelsey, strapped to a chair, bruised and unconscious. Next to her was a table full of sharp-looking surgical instruments. Kelsey, I found her. The door opened when I turned the handle. Unlocked. My god, what luck. Rushing inside, I tried to wake her up. Gently at first. Then I shouted. Kelsey, get up. We have to go. She stirred before opening her eyes. Jason, is that really you? My god, what happened? I don't remember anything. Except that drink, the visions, they were horrible, she said with great effort before throwing a coughing fit. I don't know, but I know a way out. We gotta hurry, though, I said, removing the ropes that bound her. I helped her up slowly, having to catch her as her legs collapsed beneath her. After a moment, she found her footing and gave me the look that said to me, Let's get the hell out of here. I looked around for a way out, before my heart stopped. Pastor Jeff was standing in the doorway. Jason, you are more resilient than I thought. I've never seen anyone wake up after that drink knocks them out. Kelsey fared far better than you. She was awake through everything until one of my men got a little overzealous with a club. Jason started walking towards us with a smooth stroll. You interrupted the ritual. You have robbed her of the opportunity to have the sight. She must now endure the third initiation. A leap of faith from the top of our church. If she survives, she will become one of us and gain the sight. It's a shame no one has ever survived that fall. Before I can react... I felt a searing pain in the back of my head from something blunt. I was out again. I awoke in that same room, head pounding. I sat up and looked around to find the room to be empty, save for that chair, table, and the ropes. A high-pitched squeal hit my ears like a train ramming a car stuck in a railroad crossing. The sound cleared up, and I could hear a voice. It was Pastor Jeff. Sleeping on the floor while your friend is in trouble. What kind of friend are you, Jason? Never fear. You can still save her if you hurry. Out of that room, take your first right. There's a spiral staircase. It will take you right to me. You better hurry, though. Jeff laughed coldly before the sound cut out. Without thinking, I followed his instructions. Out the door, to the right, up the staircase. My god, there were so many steps. The steel steps clunked and echoed as my feet hammered them one by one. I was completely drenched in sweat and out of breath. Pure adrenaline was the only thing fueling me to keep climbing. Faster, you swine. The trial is about to begin. Jeff's voice came through the speakers again, taunting me. My legs were as heavy as a bag of bricks, the burning sensation overwhelming. I started shouting frantically as I climbed more steps. Don't you hurt her, you psychopath. Don't you touch her. You must really not care enough to save her. I can see that now. Oh well, seems as though you will miss it. Jeff taunted me over the speakers again. Just when I thought I would collapse, I made it to a door. I burst through to find myself on the roof of that monumental tower. Kelsey was on her knees, crying. The sound of my kicking open the door alerted Jeff, 
who was reciting something from a book in his hands. So you decided to show yourself after all. You will get a front row seat then. Jeff closed his book as he said this before reaching to grab Kelsey. Stop, I shouted as I broke out into a run, pulling the pocket knife out. I lunged at him, blade out. Jeff dodged to my right and grabbed my wrist. I dropped the knife and my heart sank. I blew it. Twisting my arm, he jerked me to the ground and started dragging me over to the edge. The wind started to pick up and I felt cold drops of water hit my face. My back against the ground and my head leaning over the edge, I saw dark storm clouds move in to cover the sky in a frightening spiral. The clash of thunder, followed by white lightning, filled the sky. Jeff now stood over me, laughing. You were better off dead in a pile. What I'm going to do to you, you will beg me to throw you off the edge. The rain started coming down with force, water dropping off of Jeff's face as he twisted my arm harder. Pity you can't even save your friend. You are pathetic. Jeff said in a mocking voice when I heard a loud thud. I watched as Jeff fell forward and off the building. Looking back down, I saw Kelsey standing over me hand stretched out to help me up. Screw that guy, Kelsey said, soaked in rainwater and blood. I took her hand and stood up. Oh my god, I can't believe you did that. I looked at my savior and she looked at me. It's my fault we ended up here. It only makes sense that I get us out of it, she said with a forced smile. Okay. We have to go. Jeff took me up in an elevator. He told his men to wait for him at the bottom. They probably don't think anything is up yet. How did you get up here? There's some stairs. Let's go. I made for the stairs, and she followed. The journey down was much easier than the one up, but with how exhausted my legs were, I still almost fell a few times. We started searching for a way out. I couldn't remember where that exit sign was for the life of me. Hey, over here, Kelsey said, pointing at a door. I followed, and inside we found shelves of bottles filled with black liquid. I grabbed a bottle and motioned for Kelsey to follow me back out. What are you going to do with that? Kelsey asked as she followed. I don't know, but it can't hurt to have it. I think this is the stuff they gave us. A panic grew in me as we searched hallway after hallway, desperate for a way out. Just when I was ready to give up hope, I saw that red light. The exit sign. I pointed to it, and Kelsey nodded. Climbing up and out of the hatch put us behind the pulpit in the main room. Thank God we found the way out. Leaving so soon, the party has only just begun. That all-too-familiar, smooth, honeyed voice rang through the empty room. The man that had grabbed me and dragged me up to this pulpit was standing in front of the double doors. He reached over and pulled a switch on the wall, sounding a very loud alarm. Everyone will be coming back to stop you two. There's no escape. He started walking towards us with no sense of urgency. I looked to Kelsey, and she looked at me. How the hell were we going through him? A quick survey of the room and a bit of luck gave me an idea. The gold eye statue sat on top of the pulpit. I set the bottle down and grabbed it, moving up on my attacker. The man laughed and broke out into a run. We made contact, and he tackled me to the ground, statue still in hand. I struggled to fight back. He wasn't nearly as big as Jeff, and I found him easier to push back. I tried to roll over, but he hit me in the head with a sharp elbow, knocking me back down, the statue out of my hand. Kelsey, help! I shouted as she ran up and jumped on top of him. 
It threw him off balance, and he fell off of me. Thinking quickly, I got up and grabbed the statue. Kelsey had positioned herself behind the man and put him in a headlock. Without hesitation, I hit him as hard as I could with the heavy golden eye. A few strikes was all it took for him to go limp. Still awake, but very much out of it. Make him drink what they gave us, Kelsey said, still holding him in a headlock. I nodded before running back to get the bottle. I grabbed it and ran back to hold the bottle to his lips. I forced the whole bottle of liquid down his throat. Kelsey let go of him and ran by my side. I could now hear shouting over the sound of the alarm as Jeff's men caught up to us. The man we had just defeated started to convulse and spasm on the ground. He clutched his stomach and started wailing like a child throwing a tantrum. I turned to see Jeff's men appear from out of an archway opening. No time to watch him suffer. We have to go. We both broke into a run and got through the double doors. It was raining harder than ever as we ran to Kelsey's car. Jeff's men were not far behind. Both of our doors slammed shut as Kelsey fired up the car and backed out of our parking space. By then, we were surrounded. You have to run them over. They've killed so many people. You have to. I shouted at Kelsey, and they drew nearer. I can't. I can't. Kelsey shouted as she watched them get closer to us. Go, Kelsey, just go. Gravel spit out everywhere as she hit the gas. The sound of their bodies going under the car was horrible. One of a thousand things that I'll never forget. She's been staying at my house for a few days. We haven't told anyone about this yet. I don't know who I can tell without getting ourselves in trouble. So I'm telling you, stay the hell away from the Church of Sight.